Uh, we can now begin. Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, thank you for thank you for attending our webinar. I am Aaron De Borja, and on behalf of the English department, I'd like to welcome everyone to Zooming Out, a midterm assessment of best practices in teaching online. Uh, before we begin, um, we, the organizers of this webinar and uh, the entire English department, would like to express how surprised yet excited and glad we all are about the enthusiastic response that our webinar has received. Um, we must admit that we were a bit overwhelmed at first by the fact that as of 2.06 p.m., we have about 300 plus uh, attendees, um, um, people who have expressed their interest in our webinar. Maybe this is an indication of our uh, common sentiments, grievances even, or just questions about the new world that we are trying to explore as educators. We had initially, just to give you a, a quick background, we had initially meant for this webinar to be an informal sharing session among colleagues within our own department about the English department, about what's working and not working in our own remote classes. So as we go through the presentations for this afternoon, we'd like to keep to this exchange of ideas, of insights and experiences. And um, we look forward to having this conversation with fellow educators. So in this two hour session, the UCL faculty members will cover four topics. First, entitled Zumba, Reimagining the Classroom in Digital Space by Dr. Judy Ick and Dr. May Horilia. And then Socrates 2.0, Online Platforms for Socratic Discussions by Dr. Marby Villaseran and Professor Gabriella Lee. Then Remote Control, Balancing Student Management and Faculty Sanity Amidst the Pandemic by Dr. Eileen Salonga and Professor Vix Vasquez. And finally, Administrative Adjustments for Online Education Planning by Dr. Lily Rose Topic. So once again, for questions and comments, you may use the Q&A function below. And all questions will be addressed one, once all the panelists have given their presentations. So that's it. We can begin. Here are Dr. Judy Ick and Dr. May Horilia for Zumba. Okay. G good afternoon. Um, May and I are addressing the topic of course design and reimagining our classrooms as a digital space. Um, in our title, we ask a question, Zumba, and here's the answer. Next slide, please. Zoom boo, yes. <laughs> um, this talk is about how course design helped us to create completely asynchronous online classes. And we did so for three reasons. The first is the obvious issues of practicality, connectivity, inclusivity, and the large, you know, the large and very heterogeneous student population of UP Diliman made completely synchronous learning impractical and even unfair. Second, well before the start of the semester, our department already conducted a survey of student capacities and preferences, and an overwhelming number of our majors indicated that online but asynchronous learning would suit them best. Next slide, please. And the third reason is research. Like many of you, I was in utter panic at the thought of migrating my classes completely online. And in order to find answers, I did what most nerds do. I go to the library or, you know, digital research. <laughs> I started doing research on online education. My colleagues and I in the department took a six-week crash course on online teaching offered by professors, learning designers from universities in the U.S. and Australia. It's called Pivoting Online, Pivoting online and it's on edX. It's still there, and if you haven't yet, check it out. Um, it was very helpful for us, and what we loved about it was that it was very research-based. So every unit had an entire bibliography of things we could explore on our own. Okay. Um, one of the biggest takeaways from the course and my research is this strange counterintuitive counterintuitive notion of backward design. This is a pedagogical concept that predates online learning, but is strongly espoused by its practitioners as the best way to go. I figured, since the whole world was topsy-turvy anyway, it made sense by some strange logic to try it out and turn my teaching on its head. 
So here on the left, conventional semester, di ba, um, um, you're going to teach a class. The first question you ask is, what will you read? And then the next is, how will I you know, deliver these readings? What activities, class discussion, group work, etc.? Then you ask, how will I assess? And exams, papers. And then in the end, you have some vague hope for you know, your students becoming better people. Um, backward design flips that on its head. Um, you ask the questions in reverse. Next slide, please. Okay. So these are the four questions I came up with. To the first question, what can I reasonably expect my students to achieve in these conditions and in this modality? I came up with two answers, independent learning and writing and creating for a digital public sphere. Independent learning was an obvious answer because remote or online education demands that we equip our students with the tools and capacity to learn on their own. Um, as the centrality of the teacher, as a font of knowledge, all knowledge practically disappears in the online setup. We teach them not what to think, but how to think as is usual. And more importantly, and this is emphasized um, in the online class, how to seek out and evaluate information on their own. In the case of class I was teaching, which is English 23, an introduction to Shakespeare, my goal for them clearly became that they could, by the end of it, read Shakespeare on their own. Bonus na lang if they wanted to, but at least they could do it. The second outcome I wanted was the ability to write and create for a digital public sphere. Unlike conventional classrooms, where student work for the most part remains a private transaction between teacher and student, the online world, even in a restricted access Google Classroom, implies a public audience. It also has its own norm languages. It relies far more on visuals and other forms of media beyond the written word. Again, I found my outcome had to adapt to the modality. Having settled the outcomes, I turned to the next question. How will I know they have achieved those goals? What constitutes proof of mastery? Typically, exams or papers take care of this, but in the realities of the limitations of online learning in the midst of the pandemic, it seemed cruel to ask them to write full-blown academic papers when I myself struggled with a focus required to write more than a page. Add to that the difficulty of access to research if a student has limited connectivity or merely relies on phone data. In the absence of proctoring software, how do I give my usual 100 item spot passages midterm and final that I usually give in this course? Obviously, my usual forms of assessment had to fly out the window. In their place, I settled on two methods of measurement. Okay. Um, um, a complete textual annotation of a text not studied in class, and a multimedia project to be posted on a public blog. Notice how these assessments directly derive from the outcomes. Annotating a text displays the student's engagement with the text on her own. A public blog post, on the other hand, conforms to the norms of knowledge production in the digital realm, a form of meaning making highly reliant on media beyond just written text. Once my major forms of assessments were settled, it was then easy to determine the types of learning activities I would include in my design to prepare them for the major assessments. So there are shorter versions, a short, annotation, short annotation assignments with teacher feedback, discussion forums where they got feedback from each other, short posted projects. So apart from preparing them for the longer terminal assessments, note how the assessments have adjusted to digital space and its norms. No exams no academic papers, and nothing above 200 words. After the learning activities, I had to decide on content. What would they read? Funny how that question, which is typically first, now becomes last. May will have more to say about reading lists, but let me just make these two points. One, it is only at this point, once outcomes, assessments, activities, and content are settled, that online learning experts and designers then suggest that you determine your tech needs. This was a very liberating thought. Instead of being bogged down in questions of technologies and their availabilities and designing your courses to those technologies, this approach puts primacy on your teaching still and lets the technology serve your teaching. Second, once I had settled on this design outline, it became obvious that asynchronous learning, where I was present but not blatantly there lecturing away, was the way to go. Because how do you train a student towards independent learning if you're yapping away and supplying all the information all the time, albeit on Zoom, 
where inevitably the focus would still be the teacher. Asynchronous learning, on the other hand, fosters that sense of independence from the get-go. It does not, however, mean that you just pile on the readings and projects and let the student figure things out on her own. Asynchronous learning in online education is predicated on a different notion of presence that does not require physical contact, but manages to guide a student every step of the way. Um, to talk more about reading lists and presence and course design, I turn you over to May Hurilia. May, am I on? Yes, you are. No, my video, sorry, sorry, my video is not on. Sorry. Hello. Uh, I would like to tell you about how I redesigned an English literature undergraduate concentration course. What I basically did was cut, design, and adjust my material. So that concentration course is English 132. It is a course for English lit majors, but it is also open to others as an elective. You see here my uh, list of readings and requirements. This was from my pre-pandemic syllabus. Back in those good old days, we read six novels, two plays, and 12 poems, uh, a total of 20 texts. My initial concern and biggest challenge in transforming my traditional classroom syllabus into a new one for the digital space was how to shorten my list. And as I'm sure you know, this was not easy. It was emotional and almost painful. Part of the difficulty of shortening our lists, I suppose, has to do with the feeling of responsibility to the texts and authors we teach, as if we were their keepers. Me, I was thinking, uh, I couldn't possibly drop uh, the exquisite white sargasso sea. Uh, that just wouldn't be fair to Jean Reyes. Or uh, what about um, the incredibly brilliant Arcadia? How can I omit that? Tom Stoppard would never forgive me. But then I realized that the reality is this. Teaching in the digital space is different from teaching in the classroom. And so I had to face reality. I had to cut my reading list drastically. So I ended up with this. From 20 texts to four. I came to this informed by the fundamentals of online learning, among them backward design, which Judy just talked about. In transforming my course, I had to ask myself not how to shorten my list, but what do I want my students to learn from the course? And then how do I make them learn this? I found that I wanted my students not just to learn literature in itself, contemporary British literature specifically, but more importantly, to learn how to read literature. I wanted to equip them with a mindset and the tools to be able to study literature with guidance for now, but eventually and ultimately to be able to study literature on their own, beyond my course, maybe even beyond their time in UP. And so I had to let Reese and Stoppard and some others go as I aimed for a quality reading experience for my students rather than one of quantity. I settled on select texts, key texts that would be representative enough of the period covered by the course and that would be manageable not only to read, but to read very well in 12 weeks. When I had cut my list, I worked on the design of English 132 COVID-19 edition. Guided by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer's community of inquiry model, I had to account for a teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence in my course design. In this model, the teaching presence involves designing the course and selecting its technological tools, moderating or guiding discussions, providing direct instruction through presentation of content, assessing students' progress and providing feedback, and setting clear expectations for students. Note that the teaching presence does not necessarily have to be you, the teacher, as always present in synchronous mode. In terms of content, for instance, there is a trove of resources available on the internet, as Judy will show you later. So we don't always have to create content ourselves. We can instead curate them from the sources on the web. As for the social presence, which is the human factor in an online course, this entails establishing and maintaining communication among the members of the class, the teacher included, assigning socially interactive activities, building trust among one another, and personalizing the course, which can be done by simply addressing our students by their nicknames and by sharing some information about ourselves every now and then. Finally, the cognitive presence. 
This concerns developing the level of student inquiry, designing learning activities that are relevant, challenging, and engaging, and encouraging students to ask questions and guiding them on how to find answers. With all of this in mind, and because I like order, I created a basic pattern for each module of my course that would accommodate these community of inquiry presences. In the introduction unit uh, of the, my modules, the materials are selected articles and videos, all available online, relatively brief, less than 10 pages or less than 10 minutes each, and as a set, limited to only two to three items. The research activity is for the historical and social cultural background of the text. The concepts are provided. For Waiting for Godot, for example, I assigned post-World War II Britain, existentialism, nihilism, and the theater of the absurd. The research here is on basic or general information along the lines of who, what, where, when, why, and how, which is meant to lead students to building a foundation of knowledge for their reading. Then they take a quiz, 10 items, objective, non-graded, but counted as class participation. And my students like taking these quizzes, which is strange. Anyhow, uh, the reading component, um, my re I provide reading points in the course pack. Uh, these were my talking points in my classroom lectures before. As for the discussion forum, which makes up the interaction component of our class uh, and the module examination, let me elaborate. For the discussion forum, my students have to answer three questions I post in our Google Classroom. And then they also have to comment on two, any two of their classmates' answers. I gave instructions on their answers and comments. Basically, that these must be articulate and substantial. Simple one-line affirmative or negative posts are unacceptable. As you can see, my students have complied with my instructions and how. I keep the discussion forum open for 72 hours. I participate in them myself and I do a synthesis for each question to conclude the discussion. For the module examinations, I think of these as mini projects that would produce artifacts. This is again in keeping with online principles, online learning principles. Here's an overview of my exam for module one. The items involve creating a concept paper for an adaptation, a song playlist, and a critical treatment of the play. While I present three items, what is required of the students is to answer only one. I allow them to answer their chosen question creatively if they so wish, using graphics, for example, the adaptation as a playbill or the song list playlist as a Spotify page or whatever, um, or any other approach they might find fitting, just as long as the particulars of the exercise are met. In these particulars, I articulate meticulously. meticulously so that my students know clearly what I expect and what they need to do to meet those expectations. I give them three weeks to accomplish each exam. My students have responded very well so far. Some have actually expressed excitement about answering the exams. Some have thanked me for assigning the kind of exams that I do, saying that they are fun. And mo most of them submit ahead of the deadlines. And they have turned in very good work indeed. Now, the redesigning of English 132 did not stop when I finished my course guide and course pack. Online learning entails flexibility and adaptability, after all, so I regard the course as a work in progress, and I have told my students to consider it so as well. I'm constantly watching myself teach this course. I closely look at what I'm doing. I regularly ask my students how they are doing. My personal observations and the class feedback have given me a sense of what's working in the course and what's not. The latter I address, and so I revise. For example, I found our discussion forums had the tendency to become unwieldy, so I cut the required answers to just one, although I still post three questions, and I prescribe new limitations on the length of the posts. Even now, I have revisions in process. This midterm break threw my precision plan schedule out of kilter, so I have had to fuse the exams for modules three and four into one and adjust my grading system accordingly. We are currently in the middle of Module 3 on Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. For our discussion forum last week, I wanted to shake things up and break the midterm humdrum. So once again, I adjusted the discussion forum mechanics. I also wanted to mirror some of the character and form of the text. So I had our discussion in one long thread instead of three separate conversations. Sorry. Slides are not moving. Sorry. 
so I'll, I'll get to the I'll figure out the tech later but um hey, so, can you unshare unshare and reshare sorry um stop share there? hang on sorry sorry about that and then reshare are you seeing it yes I'm gonna stop again oh man sorry sorry I, so this is part of the adaptability and flexibility <laughs> of um, uh, online learning. In the meantime, I'll just, I'll just go on. So I was talking about Midnight's Children and changing the discussion forum into one long thread instead of three separate conversations. The students were very game about it. Um, we got 74 comments altogether. This is a class of 15, so that's quite significant, I thought. And I thought it was a success. Uh, I have a running poll now if they prefer to... Um, if they prefer to follow this format in our coming discussion or revert to the original revised mode we observed in the previous module. I'll find out the results soon. And um, again, I will adjust our uh, discussion forum accordingly. So there, that's how I redesigned English 132. My students have told me that they like the course, they appreciate its spacing and workload. Uh, and most important, they are learning from it. I guess I'm doing something right, whatever it is. I know it has all to do with reimagining my classroom in a digital space. Now we should go back to Judy once we figure out uh, our slides. Sorry about that. Okay, right. Okay, let me pick up uh, more on this idea of the classroom as a digital space. What this simply means is that in so far as, as possible, you fashion your class with born digital material and adjust course requirements to the affordances and norms of knowledge production in the digital world. It is not a replica of a face-to-face -face, um, classroom transported via tech like Zoom lectures, live recorded or readings in PDF form, but a classroom that makes tech and what it makes available shape the class itself. Okay? In case of the static text, okay, here's my example. I use a platform called myshakespeare.com. Um, this is an example of born digital material. It's interactive, it's media rich. Um, all of these little things make things pop up, video, audio, explanations, etc. cetera. Um, you know, so the text is incredibly, very media rich, very interactive. If you teach Shakespeare, I highly recommend it. I, I, I really do, I can't, I can't speak its praises enough, okay? But if you don't, um, it's also worth a look just to see potential for what we can do in UP, for example, to transform texts like the Noli, the Philly, or, you know, the stories of Nick Joaquin or something like that, that are widely taught across the country. Because it, I think it would be a great service if we had something like this that students from all over the country can use. Okay? Its best feature, this one, is an annotation notebook. Okay, that's part of the platform. And it exports your students' annotations as a PDF file to the Google Classroom. I like annotations because annotations make visible student engagement with the text. The text is not static, but it becomes interactive. Okay? I think it's better than papers at the moment, um, if you ask me, because it gives me evidence that they really read and went through the text. Papers, well, we all know that it's possible to write papers without reading the text, right? Um, I used to do this uh, as a student. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Marby and Gabby will talk about annotation, especially collaborative annotation, as a very effective teaching tool in the online classroom. Are you sharing now, May? Yeah. Next slide, please. There you go. Um, the classroom's digital space also means you use a variety of born digital resources. So, for example, in my class, I use this. It's a virtual tour of uh, the Globe Theater for my Shakespeare class. I use videos, but not like entire movies, just clips of... I, I have a series of 10 actors doing the to be or not to be seen in Hamlet. And then I use already available educational videos. Um, one from Ed, Ed, for example, another crash course literature, which I love. And the crash course series is fantastic because they have real professors, you know, lecturing what you would lecture anyway, but, you know, with, done with anim animation and for digital platforms. And then I also use guide reading guides. I, I particularly like this from uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company because it's a multi-level guide. 
So the student gets to choose whether she wants to be a beginner, an intermediate, an advanced um, learner, etc. So these are just samples of born digital resources that I've used in my class. Um, next slide, please. The course requirements, um, next slide, yes, there you go. The course requirements also conform to the norms of the digital. I asked for posted projects as a warm up to their great multimedia blog post that in the end. This, for example, is, an, is a unit we did on Midsummer Night's Dream. And I asked the question, where does your favorite character sleep? And the students just had to find an image and then give a short explanation um, for why this bedroom or this space was most indicative of character. Next slide, please. Here's another one. This one is, I asked him to look for two images um, to illustrate Hamlet's state of mind before he sees the ghost and after he sees the ghost. And these, they choose very arresting images, actually. And, um, and they, they explain why these are images of the state of mind. Uh, the one on the top right I like particularly because this was drawn by a student. She, she was so inspired that she did like a manga sort of Hamlet pre-ghost, post-ghost. And I, I thought that was fantastic. Okay. Um, because uh, wait, because we use you know the the norms of the digital, the visual okay is such um, an important dimension as it's a meaningful form of expression, and and that's what changes from a traditional classroom. Next slide, please, May. Okay. Um, yeah, I did the midterm assessment and course evaluation with my students as well. And it looks like, um, these are just some of their comments. I'm surprised somebody said, I'm, I'm super, su the, the annotations are super, super helpful, okay? I love how the chorus makes you think outside of the box, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the one thing I wanted to highlight in my bad highlighting here is in a survey, I asked them about um, how significant is the teacher's presence in the course. And this shows you that many of them strongly agreed that I was a very significant presence in the course, um, despite the lack of a single synchronous session in this class. So yeah, Zumbu indeed. Last slide, please. And this is our conclusion. It's a blank slide in keeping with the ethos of flexibility and adaptability. We don't know what happens next, but we're always ready to adapt. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ike and Dr. Horilia for uh, sharing with us your experiences and your ideas. Uh, now we move on to the second panel uh, for this afternoon. Um, Socra Socrates 2.0, online platforms for Socratic discussion. And we have Dr. Marby Villaseran and Professor Gabriella Lee for this panel. Thank you, Aaron. I'm just waiting for Jasmine to put up the slides and then we can begin. Uh, Dr. Velez uh, sorry, just a minute. Um, I also would like to inform everyone before our panelists begin that for those asking for a recording of the webinar, you may um, view the YouTube stream for your reference in the future. Uh, the entire webinar can be watched um, in that <clears> link um, after everything's done. And if you're asking for a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, we'll be asking the panelists for permission and then we'll inform you later if that's possible. Uh, we will repost uh, the link to the YouTube stream in the chat box below. So here's Dr. Pila Seran. Thanks, Aaron. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Professor Gabriella Lee and I have titled our talk, Socrates 2.0, as we'll be talking about using online platforms to facilitate online discussions using the Socratic method. I will first provide a brief introduction to the Socratic method, um, talk a bit about its usefulness in teaching in the humanities and in university teaching in general. And then I'll show you how the method can be used in an as as asynchronous class discussion by utilizing an online collaborative annotation tool. Gabby will then talk about how the Socratic method can be used in creative writing workshops through apps in the Google Suite. So I'll now begin with a brief introduction to the Socratic method. If you take a look at the course objectives in most syllabi or <clears throat> course guides, you will always see the words critical thinking inserted somewhere. It's a highly prized, though sometimes elusive skill in academic life. And we as educators aim to encourage students to go further from just rote learning and actually engage with materials and ideas in class by questioning claims and doing this in a systematized manner. So, enter the Socratic method. 
The Socratic method is a matter of questioning, but more than that, it's a cooperative, may I also say collaborative dialogue that encourages participants, now in this case students, to explore and analyze concepts through questioning assumptions in the class materials or the text they're engaging with and defending their own assumptions or positions regarding ideas raised in the said material. According to Garlikov, by being asked probing questions about the material, students are forced to engage the subject matter. There is just no way to get around it. It is a substantive engagement of the material through a fairly simple question and answer process that yields a deeper understanding of the issue being examined. Now, the Socratic method is useful in the humanities classroom because um, first, it facilitates independent and interdisciplinary learners. Second, it provides space for critical and creative thinking. And it also allows the learner to explore various knowledge-making activities. But um, you might think that the Socratic method is just limited to the areas of the humanities, law, or the social sciences. It can actually also be useful in the STEM fields, as it has been proven to help students actually understand the concepts and not just passively memorize them. Now, in the university setting, the Socratic method elevates the participation of students in class discussions, actually gives the students a feeling of ownership over the process of knowledge creation, and it also shows students their individual capabilities as thinkers and doers. So empowered students is what you have in the end. Now that we've got a brief background of the method, it's time to answer an important question. Can the method be used in online classes? Why, yes, the Socratic method can be done online, though people will probably associate this more with synchronous classes done via video conferencing tools. Zoom fatigue, though, is real, with teachers ending up more enervated after classes as they struggle to read the room without the usual nonverbal clues that they can get. And you also have students feeling disengaged and distracted without the connection that comes with on-site learning. Aside from these very important considerations, the Department of English and Comparative Literature also encourages its teachers to use asynchronous delivery in our classes, so learning can be more inclusive to those with limited bandwidth or to those students whose environment may not be ideal for video calls. Which then brings us to the next question. Is a Socratic pedagogy that engages closely with the readings um, useful in an asynchronous online learning environment? The answer again is yes. The Socratic method can be executed in an asynchronous online classroom. So what I've been using in my class is a platform called um, Perusal, and it's free to use for both teachers and students. Now Perusal is a collaborative e-reading platform that aims to improve student reading rates and encourages a more social learning environment. It does this primarily through, um, next slide please. It does this primarily through collaborative annotation where multiple people highlight and annotate in the margins of texts, something like social annotation. Due to time constraints, I will not go into detail with regard to how, um, how to set up Parasol, uh, Parasol as they do have um, a detailed um, a perusal rather, so as they do have a detailed user-friendly guide on their website, perusal.com. So one of the main features of the Perusal app is the ability to highlight and annotate the texts, which is both accessible to teachers and students. After the teacher uploads the text and, make, um, and makes it visible to students, the users can then highlight and then and annotate it by writing questions, comments, as well as throw in videos, links, and images to enhance engagement and to connect the concepts and ideas outside of the posted text. So let me show you how um, I use Perusal in my creative nonfiction writing workshop class. I upload all the reading materials in the beginning of the semester and they remain hidden until I reveal them in the weeks when they are assigned. On Sunday evenings, I allow access to the readings for the week and by then, I would have highlighted specific sections and annotated, um, annotated with questions. In this screenshot here, you can see that the yellow question mark um, at the top right the one that's um, encircled in green, that's me. Um, and that uh, question mark signifies a question that the students are required to answer. 
And students are then given the whole week to respond to the questions and to each other. So I've told students that they will be marked based on first the answer to my question, um, then um, how they've engaged with other student answers. So the answers of their classmates, they need to respond to that as well. And third, um, their answer to follow up questions that I usually post within the week. So I, you know, I post at the beginning, and then I will post sometime um, within the week as well. So some people choose to answer my questions early, as I told them that the answers um, that as answers that say the same thing as what has already been posted are not allowed. They can agree with what others have written, but they will have to develop their ideas further. Those who answer later in the week usually address the two tasks of responding to my question and engaging with their classmates' responses in one post. And this is allowed. Some of them also supplement their posts with links or images related to their answers. In this screenshot, you can see that uh, you can see one of the students replying to my question and also to a classmate's post. The at sign before the blacked out portion actually indicates the name of the classmate whose post the student is responding to. So it's like referencing the classmate. Now. On Thursday, I weave common answers together and summarize main takeaways from the student responses. I usually break up walls of text with an image or a video. In this screenshot, I use the image of the Kardashians um, to emphasize a point. It doesn't end with the summary though, uh, with the summary though, as we are talking about the Socratic method after all. No? So thinking about the topic or issue is de deepened and hopefully made more complex by posing another question based on their answers. In this image, um, the top part is a continuation of the post with, uh, with the Kardashians. No? And I continue to summarize student answers. And then the part highlighted in yellow is the follow-up question that serves to deepen the discussion and probe the issues raised by the readings further. Next slide, please. In this screenshot, you see the uh, previous slide, sorry. In this screenshot, you see the students gamely answering the follow-up questions and referencing previous texts and each other as part of their post. One strategy I use to ensure students keep going back to previous texts to link them to, uh, um, to, link them to present discussions is by, and this is something that, that I did in the first few weeks, I posted questions asking them to relate the point made in the present essay to what has been said in the previous um, week's reading. In later weeks, they learned to do this themselves without actually needing me to direct them to do so. Okay, next slide, please. And this screenshot is simp uh, it's just a sample of how you can also embed videos into your posts. So in this case, um, it's, a po it's a video from YouTube. So by using the functions of um, perusal, analysis of content, and what it means to the students, um, uh, analysis of the content, what it means to the students' writing practice, their lives, as well as the wider implications of the issues in the text emerge in our discussion. Next slide, please. I think I should note that I usually do not answer the posts one by one. Um, I think weaving, um, sorry, this is supposed to be, I think, a, um, a video, but um, yeah. Uh, I think weaving common themes together and summarizing are more successful strategies and letting them see the similarities and differences in their thinking, experiences, and how these are influenced by their socialization. What's key here is the quality of the questions that you pose and how you design the follow-up questions as they also guide the directions this, the discussions will take. So the quality of the questions that you post is very important. So there should be a design behind um, the, uh, the, the line of questioning um, that you're doing. So um, we've seen how perusal is a nifty tool, but what, that, what I'd like to focus on is what it can do for your students and their attitudes towards learning. If it plays, no. Okay, it's not playing because it's supposed it's to be in quick time. Never mind. Um, to continue, so um, as, I, as I was saying, no, what I'd like to focus on is not just perusal as a, as a great tool, um, but more on what it can do for your students and their uh, learning attitude. No. First, it makes reading social. 
So studies in the U.S. have shown that 60 to 80 percent of students come to on-site classes without having read the assigned material. So that means only 20 to 40 percent actually read. No, um, I would like to think UP students are more diligent than that. But how many times have you actually received blank stares after asking a question that could have been easily answered if they own if they only read the class readings? Now, quizzes can be used to make sure they've read, but honestly, they're a pain, no? Both for teachers who, put, who need to put in the time and effort to craft and then to mark them. And for students as well who need to remember a name mentioned once in page 12 of whatever reading. Now, in perusal, students need to go through the whole text because they need to respond to the annotations and to view others' answers, um, either to help them understand the content and concepts better or to join the conversation happening in the posts. In a study done on an introductory physics class in the U.S., which is to show that this, uh, you know, this is effective as well, not just for the humanities, no, but in other fields, perusal was deployed for two semesters. They found that in each semester, approximately 60% of students completed every one of the 17 reading assignments, and approximately 90% of students completed all but a couple of reading assignments. So not all, but... Um, a significant amount. 80% of students um, complete 100% of the reading assignments before coming to class. This is significant even for synchronous classes that have required textbook pre-reading, as when students are opposed to the material before class, they are better able to follow the material in class, they ask more meaningful questions in class, and they actually perform better um, in exams. Second, um, they, uh, perusal actually gives the opportunity to turn the students into teachers, um, thereby teaching teaches the teacher. So perusal gives students um, the opportunity to explain the concept to others, to debate, to persuade, and to engage with the subject matter more deeply. Now, third, but of course not the least, no, they receive timely feedback. So in this scenario, they get not only um, feedback from their instructor, but also from their peers. I've actually had students tell me that they think about their posts really well before they annotate because their classmates will read them then. So hiyana lang nila, right? Now, the great thing about achieving all three in a class is that these actually comply with what social and behavioral science research has revealed to be principles for effective learning. So to sum up, I found perusal to be a useful tool for students to engage deeply with the class materials and for creating a space where students can discuss the materials together and develop a shared understanding. It lends itself well to Socratic pedagogy and is a very effective way to help students think critically with other members of the class as part of an online learning community. And now I turn you over to Gabby, who will, will be talking about the workshop uh, using Google Suite apps. So thank you, Marby, for uh, that illuminating discussion on Socratic pedagogy as well as um, the use of parasol in reading. So I'll be going, uh, I'll be talking about the Google Suite, uh, how it relates in particular to the writing class and uh, the creative writing class. However, I think that these um, apps and platforms can also be translated to other classes, especially those that require students to communicate and coordinate with each other in various uh, group or peer related tasks. So Google Suite has a variety of applications that can be used for guided writing tasks with just a little bit of imagination and also some YouTube video tutorials. Uh, one can design them to be used by the students. As much as possible, these guided writing tasks may be heavy on the instruction but light on the synchronous elements. For instance, I do not require my students to log on uh, during a specific time to attend the workshop, nor do I dock points if they are unable to go on Zoom or class a uh, Google Meet if there are certain sessions where synchronicity may be needed. In those cases, I plan for alternatives and redundancies so that students have options on how they can access the requirements needed to fulfill these tasks. Because of the need to adapt to current pandemic quarantine, I've tried to think of ways to use the learning management system I preferred, in this case, Google Classroom, and the tools it offered to provide spaces for my students to enact the collaborative and critical spirit of the Socratic method online. 
Well, I have to also respect the fact that our current COVID-19 situation means that their everyday lives and routines have probably changed as a result. And therefore, I cannot demand from them to be online all the time. So next slide, please. The first tool I wanted to talk about briefly is just the discussion thread option on Google Classroom itself, which allows students to discuss certain points and ideas in the texts we are taking up in class. Similar to Dr. Hurida's experience with discussion threads, I provide questions um, and require the students to respond to their classmates. As an instructor, I intervene sometimes, as seen in this screenshot. Um, especially to either summarize certain points, provide encouragement, or to answer questions. I prefer this setup to something more informal like Facebook, where there is no clear delineation between one's private life and one's professional life. As much as possible, I would like my students to think of Google Classroom as their, quote, student life, and keep their Facebook and other social media accounts private, both for their sanity, but also for mine. Uh, next slide, please. The second tool I wanted to highlight, especially for the creative writing workshop, is actually Google Documents, which has taken the place uh, of the creative writing workshop sessions that we are used to face-to-face. -to -face. In the creative writing classroom, the writing workshop is actually one of our primary modes of instruction, especially when students go through the cycles of drafting and revising their work. However, because of the nature of remote learning, I knew that it would be unfair to demand my students to log on to Zoom during every class session and force them to discuss any number of student drafts that we have, depending on the class size. It would be exhausting and draining, and my students would not be getting the quality of responses that they needed in order to enact an effective revision. But the spirit of the creative writing workshop is in collaboration and exchange, and I still wanted to provide a space for that. Next slide, please. When set up with enough clear instructions and the timeline, Google Documents became a go-to tool for conducting asynchronous workshops. The document itself acted like a sandbox for the students to provide their comments to their classmate. So they were given instructions on responding to their classmates' works, as well as a deadline of about two weeks to comment on the work. And a workshop moderator was assigned to each text in order to summarize the comments at the end of the prescribed period of time. Uh, next slide, please. After that, the writer and I would have a one-on-one -on -one consultation where we would discuss the comments they received from their classmates, and we would work towards a concrete point, concrete points for revision. While the process may see, seem a bit more tedious, it does ensure a more inclusive way of participating in a workshop without requiring them to attend a synchronous session. And because of the way that more and more collaborative functions and platforms are opening up access to educators, it is conceivable, for instance, that one could run a writing workshop outside of the sandbox of Google Documents, for instance, Parasol or other similar websites. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, the one I'm most excited to use for next semester is Google Jamboard, which only appeared in the Google Educational Suite sometime this semester. And so um, I wasn't able to incorporate it in my uh, course design. It acts like a virtual whiteboard. So the Jamboard allows for more graphical and visual elements and activities, such as brainstorming, mind mapping, and small group collaboration. So here, for instance, is a test Jamboard I made for the purposes of this um, presentation. So each Jamboard file can have as many pages as one needs and they can be configured for different backgrounds. Uh, you can have sticky notes, other graphical elements, etc. It can be saved as an image file or even as a PDF, transforming the board into a handout for future use. Next slide, please. Though there are some online tools that work similarly to these three, I preferred keeping my activities within the same network of applications, in this case, Google's educational suite, because of these following reasons. So first is that I can safely assume that students may have familiarity with the platform's tools. At the very least, I am aware that they know how to use Google and hopefully they had a Gmail account already. The second thing is that I find that Google does have intuitive design, which means that the students benefit from this because they can just play around with the geography of the website and then eventually find out what they needed to do. 
And, and the third is, in case they didn't, they couldn't find what they needed to do, the students had access to a plethora of tutorials and FAQs about the tools. And more often than not, I do post that as well at the beginning of my class. And I do a few test runs before we work on the actual material. So this already gives the students a leg up because they don't have to open, for instance, separate tabs or log on using different accounts. The apps are all integrated within the Google environment and allows them to move information across different platforms, creating layers of contexts and conversations that can help them think and process ideas, as well as learn how to manage their own information access using these apps. Next slide, please. By finding online platforms that can be used for Socratic discussions while still maintaining an asynchronous class design provides more opportunities for a broader number of students to participate in class activities on their own time. And by designing reading and writing activities that take advantage of these online platforms, while of course being mindful of the students' time and access to resources, as well as UP's mandate of kindness and consideration during these extraordinarily challenging times, these students are given the opportunity to be included in the ongoing discussions in class without falling behind. Next slide. I think that it's part of the job of the teacher to find ways to learn, adapt, and even expand our repertoire of teaching tools in order to work towards the goals of our classes while still remaining open and flexible in terms of our students' needs. We need to remember that we cannot mimic and imaginative in finding an inclusive classroom and facilitating the kind of critical thinking that the Socratic method espouses. These choices take into consideration inclusivity in terms of knowledge production and empowering students to find their distinctive voices in the classroom. I think that when teachers make thoughtful and meaningful choices in cultivating these online spaces, students learn how to listen, how to consider, and to collaborate to become better learners and better people in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gabriela Ni nee and Dr. Villaseran for sharing with us those very helpful practices and tips. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, I'd just like to remind everyone to please uh, use the Q&A function for your questions and um, refrain from using the chat box. This is so we can address questions uh, more clearly and more efficiently. And also that the link for the YouTube streaming is in the chat box and you can access the entire webinar here in the future for your reference. So uh, thank you. Now we can move on to the third presentation, Remote Control, Balancing Student Management and Faculty Sanity Amidst a Pandemic by Dr. Eileen Salonga and Professor Vix Vasquez. Thank you, Aaron. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Just pulling up my slides here, just a second. Okay, sorry, just gonna do the, because my, my notes are on this side. Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for attending today's webinar. I'm Fix Vasquez and together with Dr. Eileen Salonga, we're going to discuss some of the ways we have tried to balance um, student management and our sanity. Um, I'll talk about my experience um, with uh, undergraduates, specifically freshmen whose first experience of UP is remote. Um, this is a first, for um, most of us, uh, just, sorry, here. Um, and this setup, the, the remote setup, even before we began this semester, um, there has been a lot of stress factors leading to much uncertainty and feelings of helplessness. Um, but as the SEM progressed, we now see that there are ways to be in control of the remote setup. And this control can translate to a better learning environment for, for us and for our students. So we draw on the principle of humanized learning um, and um, this is allowed to allow us to better manage our students um, aside from designing our course pack um, and thinking of how to best achieve learning outcomes we find that there should be a focus on students emotional health more so now that it is harder to form connections 
uh, the principle of humanized learning, as Michelle Pekansky Brock states, increases the relevance of content and improves students' motivation to log in week after week. When students relate to an online instructor as something more than a subject matter expert and begin to conceive of themselves as part of a larger community, they are more likely to be motivated, um, be satisfied with their learning, and succeed in achieving the course objectives. In an online setup where one is disembodied and not seen as often in a physical classroom, there is a likelihood of teachers and classmates being perceived as unfeeling, which can lead to students feeling lonely or apathetic. If students feel connected to each other and have a clear sense of belonging in a class, they will be more engaged and better prepared to learn. Since the familiar techniques used to build community in a face-to-face -face classroom are no longer available to us, creating a humanized learning experience, or sorry, environment may seem challenging. In this presentation, we offer techniques that have so far helped us in managing the classroom, making it feel more human, less machine, um, creating a community by humanizing the online experience, uh, being consistent in anticipating and responding to students' experiences and needs, and emphasizing care for emotional health of both students and teachers. So first I talk about community. Um, how do you build community um, in a remote setup? Some of the techniques um, that have been proven helpful to us are um, having an introduction and the personal touch. Um, second is presence through platforms. Third, having check-ins and consultations. Fourth, encouraging collaboration. And fifth is employing humanizing language. One strategy that seems obvious in a physical classroom, but is something that I totally forgot when I started this semester is doing introductions. I was so focused on making sure my course guide and modules were uploaded in Google Classroom that I missed asking my students to introduce themselves. This introduction can come in the form of a simple ask a question function on Google Classroom where the instructor and the students can view all the responses, or it can be more elaborate, like a short video about who you are as a teacher too, why you choose to be in this space, and perhaps what is different about your life these days. And the students can also share a video of themselves. This sets the tone of your class as you are already a human presence start of the semester. Pala. Um, presence through platforms uh, is also key. Uh, this is the ability to be present for your students, not only through the learning management system, but also in other ways. In a physical classroom, it is easy enough to ask a teacher to clarify something in class or wait until the session is over to approach a teacher to consult. This presence is lost in remote. One of the ways to build presence is to be accessible in real time. And this is harder, a bit hard to do with email when sometimes it feels like one is speaking to the void. Sometimes you're not sure if the receiver has even seen the email. Um, the platform I chose for this kind of real-time presence is Google Hangouts. I purposely did not use Messenger or Viber as these are tools more for personal interaction so that you have those boundaries and that delineation. Some of you, though, might not be ready to be this accessible to students, and rightfully so. It might seem like an intrusion, um, but a way to avoid this, and this is what I do personally, is to keep Hangouts on the browser and only open it during class and consultation hours. This is also a good way to check with um, students, uh, check in with students since it feels personalized. They also get the feel of an immediate response and can mimic a conversation better than an email thread can. Um, this is a way that you can also build rapport and establish some control um, that you are there for your students if they find themselves struggling. Um, and because it's not messenger, they see Hangouts purely for academic purposes, so you don't really get midnight texts from students being over-friendly. And um, actually, the, the design of Google Hangouts, it's a little clunky. So I think that also helps in a way um, for it to not feel like um, it's, it's too personal, nor just crossing that boundary. Another way to do check-ins would be through Google Forms. Um, I have here an example. I'll just stop share and share with you my, um, my browser. Here you go. So here is an example um, of a Google a way, a way to use Google Form as a way to check in. Uh, if you find that students do not open up as much or they are scared that 
saying what they feel will affect their grades. One way to rectify this is to do an anonymous check-in. So you can make it, you know, like something cutesy like this or just to do a straight up Google form, it's fine. Um, and I think that helps also because if it's anonymous, they're, they're more, you know, um, uh, they, they're, they're bound to open up more. Okay, let me just go back to my slides. Okay. So that's an example of a check-in through Google Form. Uh, here is um, thinking about collaboration this time and building a community. So by setting up and facilitating interactions in the online environment, we increase students' engagement, agency, and the sense of belonging. There must be a way for students to enter the discursive space of the course at times when it makes sense for them, aside from the opportunities for discussion provided in Google Classroom and synchronous sessions. Still using Hangouts, which you can do by setting up a group chat for the class, students clearly understand their roles, have clearly defined goals, and are given a sense of ownership and agency over their interactions. Remember that in a physical setting, students have the benefit of asking their classmates for help or socializing to ease some of the pressure. Hangouts can be one um, platform for them to do that. Humanizing language um, is another strategy in building a community and making students feel belongingness. Um, by welcoming, thanking, and generally using informal, friendly language, your students will see you as supportive and approachable. Writing that is more neutral can often be read as cold and unfeeling, especially between people who have not met in person. So even you know, um, being mindful of that, you know, the way that we say things and that we um, communicate uh, and using humanizing language also helps. Uh, of course, in building a community, one must be consistent. Uh, predictable and consistent routines are critically important in helping students um, feel calm and comfort in the face of stress. Uh, here are some of what has worked for us in building consistency. So this is what I try to do. Um, first, I try to schedule posts on the same time and day so that students know when to check your subject and do not have to rely on notifications. If they have at least four courses posting assignments and announcements, their inbox would be cluttered and sometimes they are bound to miss something. And this has happened to one of my students um, during the mid-semester. Second is to try to get to set the same deadline, um, day of the week and time of the day throughout the semester for your requirements, it's preferably on class hours. Um, so again, you know, they have a semblance of that routine that they'll only submit uh, during the class hours or class days. Third is to set office hours and be available during those hours in your platforms, um, whether this is through email or also Google Hangouts um, to, to be accessible during those times. Fourth is um, feedback and returning of assignments should be given on time. Ideally, this should be done before providing you homework, um, you know, because you're trying to build on what they've done um, before. So it would be um, ideal to already um, have given them feedback before you even give them more work. Um, and the ideal time to return work would be not more than two weeks after the deadline. Of course, easier said than done. Uh, and uh, and Later on, we'll talk about care and how to even care for um, yourself also <laughs> while doing all of these things. And then fifth, um, and this is something that's specific also to us, I think, uh, well, not to us, but um, I'm thinking to our situation in UP, is to um, have a uniform learning management system. Uh, this can make students feel less overwhelmed and confused by all the tools that are needed. Um, the ideal setup is the university uses only one LMS, um, but as far as I know, our official learning management systems, we have two. We have Google Classroom and Ouble. In Ateneo, though, they only use Canvas. No? So um, we had feedback from students where this has also become a problem, you know, like shifting and getting confused with all the tools that are needed. Um, before I turn the presentation over to Dr. Salonga, who will talk about care, um, let me end with a note given by a freshman student, um, just to uh, show you an example no, of when I did a check-in. Um, and if you can look at this note, right, he is a freshman. He says, yes, I agree with you that activities are time consuming to add the gaps between deadlines are close. And I'm afraid I can simultaneously work on the requirements of N13 and all of my other subjects. So that needing to adjust there also, no, when you read feedback like this. And then he says, I have seven other subjects, excluding English 13. To top that, I don't have a PC. 
he's only using his phone. So I can't really work that efficiently compared to other students. And then I asked him, why do you have seven subjects? And so he has like a total of eight. Now he has 21 units plus PE. And then he said, I followed the curriculum for a course. And when I enlisted the subjects, I got full units. So um, this is expected of them. Uh, building a community and being consistent, um, the things that I've talked about are only some of the ways we can manage students and help alleviate anxiety. But maybe one of the best ways outside of our efforts as faculty members is to rethink workload. Um, that is the number of units that we require our students to take. Um, now to talk about care, faculty sanity and her experience with graduate students, here's Dr. Eileen Salonga. Hi. Okay. Um, hi, Vix. Uh, hi, everyone. Vix, thank you. Um, so I will now move on to um, the next part of our uh, presentation. So um, Prof. Vasquez already talked about the two Cs, community and consistency. If you notice, these first two concepts focus more on what we as teachers have to do to support our students. Let me now talk about the third C, care, and shift the focus a little bit to the faculty. As teachers, we have to care for ourselves too, to keep sane, so that we can continue doing our job and being present for our students. We have identified three practices that are helpful in maintaining faculty sanity, which we have found so far to be helpful as well in managing student anxiety. So in the end, caring for ourselves also means caring for our students. So first, establishing boundaries. It has been mentioned earlier that faculty presence is very much needed in the online mode. We have to remember, however, that while we make the effort to be present for our students, we also have to set and maintain certain boundaries. Um, one of these is by making clear that we are not available 24-7. We can do this by appointing hours when we make ourselves available to students and doing this in a regular and consistent fashion. For instance, we can say that we will respond to emails within 24 to 48 hours, or we can say that we will not respond to queries after 5 p.m. or on weekends, or that students can consult anytime within class hours, but outside of these hours, consultations have to be arranged. Having boundaries lessens this sense of obligation or expectation that we have to respond to our students immediately all of the time. The truth is we do not have to. Once our students know when we will respond, then they will expect they will expect us to respond within the expected times. Having boundaries also have value for students. Um, it empowers them to think and make decisions for themselves, knowing that their teachers will not be available all the time. Or at the very least, they will learn to plan when to send their emails and questions if they need to get answers you know, by, by certain times. So that's the first. Next is, um, the second point is developing awareness of what we are capable of, what we can give as teachers. We are always um, conscious of our students' mental and emotional health, but we often do not mind our own. In these extremely stressful times, we have to learn to be attuned to our own mental and emotional needs too. We have to recognize our own limitations as teachers in digital space. We have to accept that the space we are now in is very different from what we have been used to, and we will have to learn and modify a lot okay, in this transition. Um, and also, all of it will be difficult and stressful, and we will make mistakes, but it's really okay. We have to remember that um, we have been thrust into this. We were not really given that much of a choice. Uh, the pandemic took that away. Um, as it is, transitioning to remote modes of learning is already difficult. Imagine doing it in a context of crisis. I believe it is totally valid to cut ourselves some slack if we stumble as we navigate our Google classrooms or, you know, um, use the wrong emojis in our um, uh, announcements uh, to students or if we make course design mistakes. An additional value of knowing and accepting our limitations is that it hones us. Uh, it hones us in, sorry, uh, uh, okay. It hones us in on the limitations of others and allows us to be more compassionate and empathetic. Effective dispositions that should of course guide the way that we conduct our classes and treat our students. When we know and accept our limits, we also become more open to ask for help or to collaborate, leading to a culture of asking and helping, 
of collaboration, which leads to the building of community. And the third practice is flexibility. Flexibility has been discussed extensively earlier, so we have opted not to talk about this anymore. We want to stress, however, that flexibility, apart from you know, it emanating uh, or, or serving a cognitive function, as discussed in the first talk, is also a demonstration of care. When we are flexible, we show that we recognize the shifting conditions in our classrooms and are responsive to the emerging needs uh, of our students. We show that we are paying attention to what we and our students can do depending on the exigencies of the moment. Flexibility, of course, has a bad reputation. Uh, and yes, it can be a bad thing. It is, after all, uh, uh, a buzzword of neoliberal, of neoliberal efforts at getting people to adjust at whatever cost to what the market deems to be required at the moment. But it can be a good thing too, if done on, our, uh, done on our own terms and with our own and our students' mental and emotional health in mind. So that's the third C, care. Um, and uh, under care, you have uh, uh, boundaries, awareness, and flexibility. Now, Prof. Vasquez mentioned earlier that her perspective and examples come from teaching undergraduate uh, courses and mine from teaching graduate, uh, uh, graduate ones. For the most part, there's not a lot of difference in the ways that we build community, establish consistency, and emphasize care in the undergraduate and graduate classes. The same principles apply. However, given that graduate students are older, more mature students, and generally have more responsibilities than undergraduates, there might be a few differences in strategies. Um, one example is that in the grad level, uh, to me, it's advisable to give the whole syllabus or the whole course guide with all the requirements and deadlines in the beginning. In the undergrad level, this may seem daunting, but in the grad level, I think it's more helpful for them to see the whole scale right away so that they can plan their work for our classes uh, with, uh, with work, okay? Not only in their other classes, but also the work that they themselves do. Uh, our grad students, my grad students are also working. Many of them are teachers actually. Um, and they also have housework and families. So there's actually a lot of time management involved for them. Um, I make it um, clear, however, that um, the, the course guide or the syllabus is not set in stone. Things can change and will change, like some requirements may be scaled down or deadlines extended, depending on how things develop in the course. All of these changes link up to the points we raised earlier about having regular check-ins and paying attention to your own and your students' capabilities as the semester progresses. The other example I can give that I think is really useful is by designing the class requirements in a way that they build up and lead toward the completion of the final project. I am doing this in one of my classes this semester where I provide a series of questions that correspond to the different parts of the analysis that they have to do at the end of the semester. So the idea is that in the end, they will already have the material that they need to finish the project and also the semester because what I really want for my students to accomplish okay, is you know, to finish the semester with me uh, despite all the limitations and constraints okay, that we are facing. Um, okay, so now you're probably wondering why I'm talking about design. What has become increasingly obvious to us in our preparation for asynchronous online learning and in the few months that we have been doing it is that a well-designed course is crucial in keeping anxiety slow, both on the part of the students and the faculty. Course design is key to striking a balance between student management and faculty sanity. Good course design follows from knowing what the objectives of the course are and then making decisions about lessons and readings and requirements based on these objectives, as the backward design model discussed by Dr. Ick uh, uh, shows uh, in, in the first talk. A well-designed course moves toward the building of a community of inquiry, establishing social, uh, teaching social and cognitive presences in the online classroom. Um, Dr. Herilia's reimagined syllabus draws on this. A course that is designed well also uses online tools that will allow for dynamic and meaningful discussions and conversations in the classroom. So we have seen examples of these online tools in Prof. Lee's and Dr. Uh, Villasaran's presentation. Finally, 
uh, a good course design is informed by a humanized and humanizing approach, what we just talked about, right? One that is sensitive to the challenges and limitations faced by both the teachers and the learners. Thus, a humanized and humanizing perspective to online learning should be an integral component in the course design. Okay, let me now end by saying that many of the things we talk about seem somewhat obvious. That is, we already know that these things are, uh, that these are the things we need to do to, re to respond to our students' mental and emotional needs and also to take care of our own. Um, there are, uh, sometimes I feel like, do I really have to say these things, right? Because it seems like everyone should already know this. But based on some of the things that we have heard and also based on some of the things that we have learned from our students, for instance, um, simply being given hard drives of readings and then a list of assignments or being required to attend all synchronous sessions as if they were face-to-face -face despite internet connectivity constraints, we think that these reminders are still important. They need to be said to remind ourselves that we are in now that we are not living in, north, uh, in normal times and we shouldn't act like uh, we are. Uh, we also want to stress that the practices we have shared today are easily said than done. Again, these are not normal times. As teachers, we have to allow ourselves to make mistakes and to remember that we need structural support to do our job well. If we are willing to be kind to our students, we should be equally willing to be kind to ourselves. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Salonga and Professor Vasquez for those uh, helpful and really comforting words. Um, before we move on to the last presentation, we'd just like to address a few concerns right now. For those asking if a certificate will be provided, we're afraid that uh, no certificate will be for provided for attending the webinar since it is a department initiative meant to um, facilitate an exchange between the practices of colleagues of the English Department of UP Dilemma. Uh, and once again, for those asking if um, PowerPoints, uh, copies of the PowerPoint presentations will be provided, we will have to ask the speakers about this, but you may watch the entire webinar uh, for your reference in the future via the YouTube link, which is also pasted and will be repasted in the chat box. Okay, so now we move on to the last presentation, Administrative Adjustments for Online Education Planning by the Department Chair, Dr. Lily Rose Tope. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, man. Okay, good. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, this is a bit belated, but I would like to welcome uh, the participants to this webinar, especially our colleagues in the various UP campuses and our colleagues too from the other universities around the Philippines. So welcome to our uh, small webinar, and I hope that uh, you can take home something you know, from the things that we've shared this afternoon. Okay, I also want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of UP administration to the necessities of remote learning. Uh, they have offered various kinds of, uh, excuse me, of webinars, and they have offered material, technical, and psychological support to both faculty and students. Uh, what I would do for this afternoon is actually to focus on what we have done on the ground. So it's a bit discipline specific, a bit department specific. Uh, I divide this talk into three parts. One would be, the first one would be preparation. The second one would be the challenges. And the third part would be the recommendations or solutions to the challenges. Next slide, please. Okay. So the first part is on preparation. And I think the first important thought here is to prepare early. Time is always of the essence. And when we wanted to prepare for the beginning of the school year, 2020, 2021, we actually began uh, towards the end of the second semester, a few months after the lockdown and worked through the mid-year. So we wanted to prepare ourselves for what is to come. And uh, the first thing we did was to do a needs assessment. So uh, first we did a needs assessment for teachers. Uh, we did a survey of ourselves in the department. And there are two things that we asked the teachers. One, do they have machines? Second, do they have the technical skills? 
Fortunately, most of our faculty members have computers and gadgets uh, and therefore are machine ready to teach by remote. Technical skills will be a different matter. Uh, as you have seen in the presenters, not all of them, not, sorry, not all of us are like them. So I will uh, use myself as a case in point. I'm the oldest member of the department and I'm a, a, actually a coward when it comes to technology. So if you give me anything beyond PowerPoint, I will run away. So the digital co committee uh, created a tutorial no, addressed to people like me, to titas like me, who are afraid of technology. And uh, they walked us through uh, Google Classroom, point by point, blow by blow, hand-holding galore. And today I find myself uh, enjoying the conveniences of Google Classroom. So if you are like me, if you are a tita like me, uh, you can let me know and I can share the Google tutorial with you. Uh, the second, uh, next, next slide please. The second um, survey would be on students. Uh, we've already done, uh, we, we did the first survey before the first semester and we've already done the second survey for the second semester. I'd like to share with you some of the questions we asked in the survey. So, and the responses, of course. So one, we asked them, are they enrolling? So fortunately, 99% said that they intended to enroll. Second, what classes do they need? This is for our own purposes, so we can plan ahead what courses we have to offer. We also asked them, what technology do they have? Most, compute, most have computers and gadgets, which is, again, very fortunate, but some uh, have problems with Wi-Fi. You know, there are stable Wi-Fi. And the third one is interesting because uh, we get answers like this. Computers are shared with working parents and siblings. So the student can only uh, use the machine, can only use the computer, only when everyone else has finished working. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, the next question is, what kind of remote learning method do they prefer? and most preferred the asynchronous method because it gives them the time and space uh, to do their assignments and requirements. Next uh, question is uh, how many subjects can they tackle in one semester? So this is very interesting data because 20.8% said they can only do two subjects. 18.1% said only three subjects. 7.3% said only one subject. And yet there are some students who have 15 to 18 units. So you can just imagine uh, how burdensome you know, this uh, study load is on them. Uh, we also asked them what kind of challenges they have uh, in regard to remote learning. So again, uh, this has cropped up. Uh, they are in charge of housekeeping and taking care of younger siblings. Graduate students are also working teachers and are doing remote teaching as well. And the third one is, of course, expected mental health issues in the age, in the period of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay, because we did not know anything initially about remote learning, because we did not know uh, how to conduct uh, a remote class or even to design a, a course uh, dedicated no, to uh, remote teaching, we did research. And we did research on the best practices. Um, and this is the product uh, of, uh, of what, we have, uh, what we have researched on. This is what science says. Okay, so the ideal number of students per class is 12 to 15. So a 35 student class is unconscionable no, in the time of the pandemic. The ideal study load for every student is 12 units. The ideal faculty load for teachers, teaching load for teachers is nine units. So um, the school year is split into three sections. First SEM, nine units. Second SEM, nine units. And in the mid-year, everybody teaches six units. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. And so we listened to the data, no? we listened to the research, and this is what we advocated, and this is what we uh, implemented in the department. Next slide, please. 
what are the challenges? Okay, now the first challenge is the volume of students. Because of smaller class size and reduced teaching load, many students were not able to enroll in classes, especially in English 13. Uh, English 13 is the required English course for everyone. Everybody must take this, and it's usually taken in the first year. A lot of them, a lot of uh, freshmen were not able to enroll in English classes because of the reduced class size and reduced teaching load. We are also confronted with students with only zero to six units. So we had to go out of our way to help these students complete uh, the 12 unit requirement. By the end of the enrollment period, we had to concede by increasing student intake to 17 per class. Uh, we had no choice, we had to help, but this is not what science wants. Okay. And lastly, there is the expected backlog. Because of the reduction in class size and in teaching load, we knew that there will be a backlog. So let me just share with you English 13 figures here. For the first semester, we filled 900 plus slots in the first sem. 1,000 plus slots were unserved. So there were 1,000 plus students who were not able to get into class. Hopefully, in the second semester, we will serve the 900 plus students and the rest will take the course during the mid-year. The mid -year. Next, slide, next slide, please. Okay, um, the next challenge would be students who insist on higher study load of 15 to 18 units. And the reason is that they wanted to graduate earlier or on time. However, the mid-SEM mid survey shows that those complaining about the workload are those who have more than 12 units. And those who drop subjects have more than 12 units. So we're hearing this, we're, we're, uh, we're going to do something about this uh, so that uh, the burden on the students will not be so heavy. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, other challenges. We are flustered when students who are who come to us in the seventh week of a 12-week semester. These are the students who enroll late. We don't know what happened to them, but uh, it puts us in a bind because teachers are torn between academic integrity and compassion. We don't know what to do with them, but most teachers refuse them because of the lateness of the enrollment. And then we also had a sudden demand for English 1. English 1 is no longer a GE course but it is a basic English course that we normally reserve for foreign students. Uh, other colleges seem to be interested in it as a bridge course. And uh, we were inundated though, by the demand during this semester. Next one would be students who opted for printed course packs. Not all students in UP have uh, machines, have computers or gadgets. And so they opted no, for printed course packs, especially uh, students who have gone back to the province. Uh, before enrollment, uh, we wrote um, the Office of the University Registrar, uh, if we can put all students who, re um, who requested no, for printed course packs in one section. Why is this? Because the instruction uh, in an in online form and instruction in a printed course pack would be different. So a teacher who has both you know, would be it's like teaching two courses. Uh, we were refused in our request, but uh, somewhere uh, halfway through the enrollment period, the OVPAA stepped in and helped us uh, convince OUR. But by the time it was too late, uh, we had already sent out the course packs, uh, but we will do the arrangements uh, earlier in the second semester. And lastly, there are students who lag behind uh, due to mental health issues, family problems, and love lives. It is interesting how many students have love issues uh, and they have difficulty with their academic work during the pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. So now we come to the recommendations. Um, these uh, recommendations and solutions uh, are addressed to the challenges that we have encountered. So the first one is an information dissemination on class size, faculty teaching load, and 
student study load. I think we have to inform everyone of the science. Students may want to know why there are fewer slots, why they are encouraged to have 12 units only. Okay. Second, we must find a way of copying uh, study load to 12 units. Now, this is a little bit controversial because it may impinge on the rights of students to get a higher load. But uh, again, in our research and uh, according to the science, 12 units is the healthy load. Number three, we need clear guidelines on late enrollment from OUR. How late is late? Is one third of the course late or two thirds of the course late? So we can also act accordingly. Next, better coordination with other colleges regarding course needs. We send each other requests for slots uh, in offered subjects, but if there is uh, a bulk of students, then we need uh, an early heads up so we can, uh, uh, we can accommodate you. No? And then next slide, please. We also need early coordination with the OUR regarding sectioning of students needing printed course packs. I think I have already um, mentioned this. So we will start early for the second semester. And the next, the department addresses and prepares for the backlog caused by the smaller class size and decreased teaching load. Aside from distributing the offerings uh, from uh, first, second, and then mid-year, uh, sorry, first, second semesters, and then mid-year, we're also thinking of reviving things like advanced placement exam. Uh, once upon a time, hardly anyone passes this exam, and so nobody, uh, nobody wanted to take it. But maybe if we can revise it, make it more friendly, then more students can avail of it. And then last but not least, uh, create an office for student support, at least on the college level, to which students with problems can be referred. Our college dean, Dean Ami, uh, has already begun this with a committee on wellness. Uh, perhaps she can also include a love counselor. So I hope this uh, short presentation was useful and meaningful Thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tokyo. Yeah. Very helpful presentation. Okay. So at this point, uh, we can now open the question and answer uh, portion of the webinar. Um, some questions are addressed specific to specific um, speakers. Well, some may be answered by any speaker. So we can begin with a question from Elihia Clemente, there are some students, she says, there are some students who do not want their submitted works being posted publicly. Since one of the purpose of the course is to develop their communication skills, how do you encourage such students? You want me to answer? Yes, GB. Um, yeah, I, I saw the question, I found it strange because I have been using public blogging as a tool in teaching since 2010, long before the pandemic. Um, I find that there is initial trepidation about going public with your work, uh, but more often than not, it makes them produce really good work because, you know, they're so, um, you know, they're so conscious of it being public. And so it actually raises the, the, the level of the work that they've done. And I haven't had, since 2010, haven't had a single student say, Mom, I can't do this. I don't like posting. Because, my God, they, they all post them on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. Um, but um, if I imagine a student would have real issues, then I would simply say, okay, I won't post it, but give me the assignment. You know, and I would still grade it as such. But I think that... So far, uh, I haven't encountered problems because these kids, they have no problems with sharing, right? They overshare their lives nga, eh, di ba? Lahat ng pagkain nila, alam mo. So, uh, you know, um, I don't know. But, I mean, I would make concessions for sure. But I, I haven't had that issue come up in the last 10 years I've been doing this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ik. Uh, um, can I add something lang, Aaron? Mr. Bilasiran. Um, I think uh, if if the you know if the discomfort is coming from maybe the whatever is going to be written and posted or produced, no, 
um, and posted is something that's quite personal. Maybe the assignment can be adjusted. Like um, this is something that we should think about from the beginning, no, while we're doing the course guide, especially if we're going to make things public. Is it going to be problematic for um, the students? That Will they be revealing too much? I mean, when we do research, Diba, we're very involved with the ethical side of it. Na we try to you know, eliminate them. So I can see why meron among uh, lalo na if it can cause harm to the student or whoever around whoever is around the student then that becomes a big consideration so maybe it's time as well to think about um what assignments were we are requiring that will have to be made public in line thank you Thank you, Dr. Villaseran. The next question uh, concerns copyright restrictions. Dennis Aguinaldo is asking, did you need to plan around copyright restrictions? Yes, Dr. Hurilia. I can answer that. Not in a, I'm afraid I can't answer that in a general sense because I don't know the particularities in the different areas. But that was a big concern for me because, of course, I teach is contemporary British literature. So all of these are protected by copyright. Now, ideally, um, uh, we ask permission from the authors and their publishers. Uh, it takes, I've done this for another project and it takes around 50 emails, um, a month if you're lucky, if you're not, maybe a year or two years and, and all that. But the thing is, um, we do not have to provide our students copies of the texts. Uh, I found that because in traditional classroom setting, uh, the texts didn't come from me. Uh, I assigned the texts. Um, they had means or foul or fair uh, to procure the texts. Uh, and I just don't ask. Um, I do direct them if, if they have the means to legitimate sources. Um, it's a pity we don't have the library because you know that's that's one uh, area that they can um, borrow and uh, you know procure the text uh, copies from themselves. But um, if you're not printing it in your course pack, uh, if you are, then that's a problem, I think, uh, because you would be infringing on copyright. And we cannot only so far hide behind fair use doctrine. Was. And I told my students from the very beginning, you are responsible for um, procuring uh, or uh, acquiring the primary texts that we are studying, the four texts that we were studying uh, in the course. Uh, the poems were available online, so that was not a problem, legitimately available online. But uh, the play and then the two novels uh, were not. Um, I just told them that uh, you have to, as, as in real time, old style, you have to be uh, responsible for the copies. Um, and let me know if uh, you're having difficulty. Uh, and then I figured I'd deal with it after that. Um, and so far, well, they did find the copies. There was no issue. Some I know bought some, and I encouraged those who had the means to buy legitimately e-copies because they were available. Uh, but the reality, again, also is most of them don't have the means. Um, but surprisingly, no one came to me with a problem about how to acquire the texts. Uh, so it's not, um, mind you, I am very um, aware of copyright and uh, I, I do respect very much uh, copyright, but um, the reality is, I keep saying the reality is, um, I, it's no different from regular time. I don't think we can be so righteous to say that we've always respected copyrights with our readings in the traditional setting, uh, you know, uh, and how different would it be in this setting? So um, I don't know if this answer will get me into trouble, but essentially I don't ask and they don't tell, but uh, they get their, they've gotten the copy so far. May I also say something? Yes, Dr. Tate. Okay, uh, we actually had a long discussion of this, uh, with the faculty members and we consulted uh, a lawyer uh, who is actually with the department. And uh, she actually said that even giving the link to students would be considered a copyright infringement. So naloka kami lahat, no? Because, you know, we normally give links to the students. And uh, so we asked her, so what should we do? 
she said, just list, you know, just give the title of a work and then make the student look for uh, a copy of the work. And so if you don't want to go to prison, then maybe just choose uh, works that are available online. No? So you don't have to like uh, uh, see Roxa copy and put it uh, you know, in your Google documents. So that's what I learned this semester. Uh, there are legal things that we have to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Topin. Thank you, Dr. Horilia. Our next question, um, a couple of questions concerned about uh, evaluation and rubrics. Uh, we can combine them. Um, some refer in particular to certain platforms like Perusa, and some can be answered in a general sense. Uh, Eileen Ramirez asks, do you use rubrics in evaluating participation or forum responses? Well, Jasper Obico asks to Dr. Vilja Seran, I was wondering how you graded your student interaction, for example, engaging to classmates and responding to your questions. Did you use a rubric for this? Maybe Dr. Vilja Seran can start, yes. Sige. Um, <laughs> I'll refer to, ano, to the title of a talk given by ano, Dr. Judy Ick, the resisting the rubric talk. No? Um, I am, I'm a bit ambivalent about the rubric. Uh, on one hand, I see how um, students can benefit from a clear guide as to how to answer, and then it can also set up expectations diba, as to what you want. But uh, at the same time, um, especially in a humanities class, I'm, I think it's a bit difficult to you know, kind of quantify the answers, especially if you're talking about, let's say, itong Socratic, um, itong Socratic method and Socratic discussions. This is, um, this is one of those cliche moments where in the process is more important than the product, no? Um, and how do you, you know, how do you quantify that process? Um, I do give grades, pero I'm also cognizant kasi of, um, for example, the fact that, you know, this is online learning, this is a pretty new platform. Um, and yes, I grade, as I, as I mentioned in my talk, um, I did grade them based on how they answered my question as well as how they engaged, but I do, did not follow a rubric. I'm pretty, as of this, for this semester now, I'm pretty generous when it comes to grading as well. Like, um, just as long as they give a substantive answer, um, it, you know, they, they get, uh, you know, if, 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 if we're going, if we need, actually need to, to quantify it, parang they, they get a, you know, more than just a pass, parang ganun. Pero as, as, as to a specific rubric or quantifying um, yung, yung uh, participation uh, nila in the, in the fora, hindi ko ginagawa. Right. And um, can, I, can I just add, a rubric or a grade, numbers, is not the only way to give feedback. So that if the teacher is very involved in the discussion forum, you know, I, I, I cut and paste their text, I put emojis next to them, this, yeah, and I learned that. Um, all kinds of things to reinforce good answers, to ask questions, to direct answers. So that's sort of a way, the conversation is a way of giving feedback. Um, on their work and I don't give rubrics because I don't like the fact that then they write to the rubric you know um, I don't want to limit them to that I don't want to tell them what I want to see show me what you've got and I think rubrics really limit the creativity of students but that's me that's all I have to say um, Aaron, I do, I do have something to add. No, for for those, naman, to be fair, naman to those who feel more like um, they actually, you feel more comfortable um, to be able, you know, if they can be able to quantify things. Um, Perusal actually has an analytical tool um, for for on the teacher side, no, that can show you who has read. How, um, per student, uh, who has read, how much time was spent reading, and un even until what page was read, if the, re if the student actually read through the whole thing. No? And it can also show you how many times students posted or annotated. So if you want, you can have a look at this, but um, I tried it and it, um, it didn't work for me. I, I was doing the summaries and the weaves anyway. So, you know, I was reading through everything and getting a good grasp of, of um, of how much the students were engaging with the texts and in the discussion uh, with the text, the discussion, and with each other. 
Thank you, Dr. Belisarian. And also, Dr. Horilla would like to add something. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, for um, the class participation, um, uh, for the discussion forums and for my quizzes, which are under the class participation component, which is 20% of my grade, um, I don't have rubrics either. I don't understand what rubrics are. I, that's an alien word to me. But what I do, uh, and again, it's, it's um, specified from the very beginning, is that um, the students know that this is, as much as I can give an objective component to their grade, uh, I count. I count how many uh, posts they have. I count if they've done the quiz. And then, of course, I have a grid of, you know, the, the expected because because it's numbered. They're expected to give three, five, et cetera. Et cetera. So uh, that's where the grade comes in. Um, uh, if, if they gave more than what was expected, then it's equal to this grade. If they gave this much, it's, it's equal to this grade. So everything is counted. Um, but that's just for the, the, well, the participation. In terms of the quality, I found that because that it's not an issue, it's not an issue that, oh, this has to be good and I have to answer to this question and I have to whatever. I find that the pressure is out. And so far, I've gotten more than I wanted in terms of their discussion input. In fact, I have to rein them in. And that is part of my adjustment. I had to tell them, hoy, ang haba naman ang masagot niyo, ang serious niyo. Um, uh, so um, I, I, as, as, as my colleagues have, have said, it's hard to, to, to quantify thought uh, discussion, you know, reaction. How do you say it's good or it's bad? And, you know, uh, so I do to serve the responsibility and the duty of giving grades. This is the system I've come up with, you know. So for class participation, it's counted, but um, I set that aside and then we focus on just having a really good discussion. Uh, and I found that. So far, you know, it's been going well. And I do this also, mind you, I do this also, I, I do this in regular time uh, in my classroom discussions before where they're reading response sheets. Uh, nothing is graded in terms of the content. Uh, it's in the quantity. But the content, uh, I read, I respond, I tell them, mm, this is really, a, you know, not a good thing. And I also, they know that I don't count um, answers, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I don't count simple aff affirmative or negative uh, answers. You know, so uh, they know well enough to participate uh, and participate fully and, and intelligently. So I've been lucky that way, I suppose. Thank you, Dr. Horilia. We also have um, Dr. Eileen Salonga. Uh, yes, ju just to add to uh, uh, the points already raised, no? um, I think for students, it's helpful sometimes to give them some guidelines on how to approach the discussion forum, like, um, you know, what kinds of answers you expect from them. So that's what I do. So I have this like long uh, list of like guidelines and I kind of explain yeah. there how I want them to, to participate. Yun nga. And so it will avoid just... Um, giving like fact-based answers, you know, or like I agree, do not agree, no explanations and so on. So I talk about how the answers, um, responses have to be thoughtful, have to, you know, further the conversation. And of course, also, you know, how to be respectful when they respond. So all of these things, I think, help in um, fueling the discussion. So um, that's one. And also the, the other thing, is um, I, tell my, uh, I tell my students that um, they don't have to be afraid to answer, right? Because um, it, it's part also of building that community where you feel a certain um, sense of uh, security that, you know, you're in a safe space. So you can, you know, um, just answer, okay? But also answer thoughtfully, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, intelligently. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Salonga. Uh, since we've mentioned uh, perusal earlier, maybe Dr. Villaseran could also address uh, a couple more questions about the technicalities of perusal. I will be combining some questions uh, we have here uh, from Nathaniel Yang. Can the features I'm not a salesperson, ah, so I don't <laughs> have the full technical knowledge. Ah. This webinar is sponsored by perusal. No, <laughs> 
Can uh, Nathaniel Yang asks, can the features of Perusal be found in the native features or plugins of the Moodle platform, uh, such as the ah, forum okay. discussion activity? Um, was the use of Perusal based on familiarity with the functions of the software and not on a lack of functionality on the part of the Moodle platform used in UP? And uh, just a short add up. Also, someone is asking if Perusal requires a PDF wherein the text is detected. And how is it for students with weak internet or students using a smartphone, since this is also a feature? What's the first question again, again Aaron? Um, it's about... Uh, uh, the features of Perusal are found in the features or plugins of the Moodle platform. And what's okay, the um, project yeah, line? Okay, Sige. Uh, I'll answer that question first. No, I, I was... Uh, I think we were informed that Uble, uh, which is uh, based on Moodle, no, um, will get an upgrade. So I think in that upgrade, um, yeah, uh, collaborative annotation will also be included. I, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with um, with Uble or with Moodle. So I mean that uh, the older version of Moodle, which um, Uble has, I think. So. Um, not very familiar with that. I have been using Google Classroom since for ages, so it's it's the one that um, I used as well for when when transferring on when we moved to the online space, and I just found that um, the annotation um, capabilities of uh, of Perusal, especially you can you know you can link videos you can uh, you can upload images i'm sorry i wasn't able to show you um how it looked like no but I, I i found that attractive and i thought you know um students are visual as well so i i figured that it would enhance student engagement um too so that's uh if you're talking about me at the beginning of the at the beginning of the semester or prior to the beginning of the semester, looking at Uble and then looking at Perusal um, and then comparing. I wasn't doing that because I was, um, and I think this was something that was talked about as well by Dr. Ick, that um, the tech came last for me. So I, I looked first at what I wanted um, to get out of the, of the whole semester, and then um, I, and then I looked as at as as well at the capabilities of the students if they had access to a computer and such, and that's when I decided on that particular platform. Okay. Um, and the second question, sorry ha, parang magkaiba sila, so medyo naluto ako. Uh, the second question is um, about the PDF feature, if it if it ah. requires. Okay. Um, that you input a PDF file, I believe. Most of the PD, uh, most of the PDF files that I uploaded, parang they seem to, I uh, know. Um, I think Perusal has an automatic OCR. I think the uh, the text rec recognition tool. So I never had problems with it. Um, when when I say text as well that you can upload to um, Perusal, you can upload videos as well, and then you can annotate even the videos themselves. So, parang according to timestamp. So, um, I've I've never had a problem. So, I've been uploading PDFs as well as Word files and uh, and and uh, as I said, a YouTube video. I never had problems with them. Thank you, Doctor Villasaran. Our next question um, can be addressed to all the speakers. Uh, it's from an anonymous attendee. They say, hello, thank you very much for sharing your best practices. These models are helpful when so many teachers are teaching online for the first time in uncharted territory. My questions concern the teaching of general education or GE classes. I would like to ask all the panelists, in your experience, do students in GE classes respond differently to the practices that you presented? Are there significant differences between your teaching practices in GE classes vis-a-vis -vis those in major subjects? Thank you. We can begin with Professor Gabriela Lee. Yes. Okay, I can start. Um, the big difference that I've noticed um, is, especially for GE, for my GE class, so I'm teaching English 13, which is composed of freshmen, um, there needed to be just a little more elaboration in terms of um, giving instruction, for instance, or just being clearer and more explicit in terms of what you're asking from them. Um, they also took more advantage of consultation time. Like uh, for me, I had the weekly consultation 
uh, that wasn't required for my students, but it just basically meant I was available during class hours if they needed to talk to me or to ask questions. My major class, my majors, uh, my students in my majors and my grad class never or rarely took advantage of it. Um, but my my English 13 class took advantage of that a lot. Um, and so I realized that uh, it's probably a mix. Of, it's a mix of obviously the online uh, platform, but also because it was their first time. This was their first semester in their first year of college, and I'm pretty sure they also had a hard time adjusting. And so I think the weekly consultations became helpful for them to just kind of have a gauge of of the work that they were doing and where they were, and, and kind of navigating the weirdness of of a pandemic semester. Um, so yeah, so that was the main difference that I noticed. But other than that, um, quality of answers were still good. Uh, they all they they were able to meet their deadlines. Those who had um, issues with uh, tech issues uh, raised it early enough that we could find another solution for those problems. Um, but I think it really meant it really did mean that I had to have an open line of communication with my students, and that they were they were not afraid of asking questions. And I think that was important. Um, to, to foster that kind of community where they wouldn't be afraid to ask questions. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, okay, so we can now move on to the next question, again from another anonymous attendee. This one is about the Socratic method. Um, the anonymous attendee is asking, what can you say about uh, the demand on time of the, of the, of the Socratic pedagogy? Um, I, Anonymous attendee says, I've tried creating the same system using the forum activities in Ouvle. What I belatedly realized is that this requires me to be in attention almost 24 seven, an exaggeration. But unlike before where the face-to-face -face meetings provides us a real time discussion that is concentrated in a certain time of the week, this setup requires us to monitor all the time and respond uh, instantaneously. Otherwise, it piles up and the instructor is unable to catch up. Uh, this is particularly hard for lecturers like me before the face to face meetings and occasional correspondence is enough. That's a question. Uh, Dr. Ik? I have a I have a quick fix about that. I told my classes I'm online from 9 to 12 every day so that if they want instant responses, um, I'm there. So it to me it was a quick fix and it also helped me schedule. I mean, I told them if they couldn't be online with me to discuss with me, it's okay to do it later, I'll catch up. But but since I told them the time slot that I'm online and I'm there and I answer, um, they show up, show up, you know, and we're discussing simultaneously. So I think a schedule actually really helps. Okay, um, that's me. Thank you, Dr. Ik. We also have Dr. Salonga for the question. Yes, um, I, I was talking about not being there 24-7 uh, because, I guess, it will really drive us crazy. Um, I think what also helps for me is um, telling my students that I will not actually respond to everything but that I will be reading everything. So what, what I do is that I wait for the responses actually, and then take note of those points that are similar. Um, and then later on, when there are like enough responses basically saying the same things, I synthesize, okay? And then I point to the responses of like, you know, this person said this, this person said that, blah, blah, blah. Now, after having said all of these, maybe this is what you should be thinking about, or maybe this, this is what you should now be looking into. So it's also it's my way of synthesizing and also di directing the conversation forward. Because sometimes what happens is that they actually say the same things, right? Okay. But then, so what you need to do is to sort of see how the same thing, how these things are similar and how, in fact, by sort of putting them together in some kind of like, iba parang may kwento, uh, then they, they can actually proceed to talking about, let's say, even more critical, more significant points. So that's what I do um, in, in my discussion forums. Um, or at least that's what I try to do. And, and I, I think for, for the most part, um, at least in one class where this is already like really ongoing, um, I, th I think it's been working. So that is something that maybe you can try. Thanks. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Salonga. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Just to remind the attendees we have, we're extending until 4.15 p.m. and we'll squeeze as many questions as we can until then. The next question is from another anonymous attendee asking um, if you have tips for faculties who have 120 students in their classes. Uh, I think um, and any speaker can answer. Uh, um, um. <laughs> for me, sorry. I don't know if that's an answer or ano, ano, 120, but I do, um, but I have been in those parang big hall classes. No? Um, but I think Dr. Tope talked about this um, a while ago, that the ideal class size is what, ma'am? 12 to 15, diba? if I'm not mistaken, um, based on ano, studies. No? So and, and, and I think this question came up, and ano yung ideal class size. So, na mentioned naman siya ni Dr. Tope na 12 to 15. Um, I think one thing that, um, and this is mentioned as well by doc, by Dr. Ike, parang hindi kasi direct transposition of face of on-site learning ang <laughs> online learning. Hindi siya nangyayari in that way. These are different, you know, uh, modalities. And that's why the course guides were done um, and were uh, no, asked to be done differently, di ba? With acknowledgement of this. Um, I think one thing that we all have to remember is that online learning is more time consuming talaga. This is something that should be acknowledged when it uh, when it comes to assigning teaching load to uh, when it comes to assigning study load for students and class size. And for the most part, I think people have been deaf to this. Um, the English department actually had to make a stand. Sabi nga di Dr. Tope, pero kahit kahit ganon, 'di ba, parang nabraso pa rin kami and then or blackmailed ba? Para emotionally blackmailed minsan. Kasi of course, naawa ka rin dun sa mga student. Pero this is something that everyone should acknowledge already and uh, and acknowledge as a reality, no? Kung pipilitin mo yung dati, what will suffer would be the quality of the of yung, yung delivery mo. Diba? So what what do you want in the end, diba? Pa na, ano, ano, ba yung, ano ba yung gusto mong kalabasan uh, na product after, you know, this semester? Thank you, Dr. Villaseran. Uh, okay, so I think we can move on to the next question. The next question is from uh, Christine Hui. Uh, thank you for this initiative. Uh, during our synchronous class sessions, there were instances um, when a student would leave the meeting with the video, with his video turned on intentionally so that I would not notice that he left. Towards the end of the class, I called them to give a summary of the lesson, but they did not respond. Thankfully, after emailing them about not doing it again, they did not repeat it. I also noticed that there are a handful of students who did not join breakout rooms after I assigned them to breakout rooms. I suspect that they are not really present, although they are logged into Zoom. In the next semester, I would like to ask if there is a way for us to identify the students who would need financial assistance in order for them to log into Zoom with their video turned on so that when we conduct classes online, we can say that we will not tolerate those acts like cutting classes since they would not be able to say that they have problems with internet connectivity. Me, uh, any one of the speakers can answer or, um, okay, uh, because we're pressed for time, we can answer this privately via chat. We can request um, some of the speakers to answer this privately via chat. We can move on to um, the next question for, uh, for Dr. Horilia. Um, an anonymous, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, you're muted. Oh, okay. You will just answer privately, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ask the general questions, no lang. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, another general question is um, from Celeric Andres. I am curious as to how the college addressed late enrollees, since I have late enrollee students too, and we are given instructions to be as compassionate and admit and admitted them, adjusted for them and all. So how did the DCL, did the UCL handle this? Uh, I think that's my question. Yes. Um, well, it's a difficult thing uh, because everyone is torn, as I said, between academic integrity and compassion. Um, for us, what happened was, you know, that's why we needed guidelines, you know, how late is late. So if they show up two-thirds through the, the semester, 
I think it's impossible for the faculty to take them in no? because they miss two thirds of the, the semester already. And we cannot force the, the faculty member, the teacher to accept such students. Uh, I have advised one student to just do an LOA and then uh, re-enroll next semester. No? Uh, th this student had problems with OUR um, and was able to clear the deficiencies only on the seventh or eighth week of the semester. Uh, it is, uh, for want of a better term, it is criminal to impose such a student on a teacher. So um, uh, this is why the guidelines are important. No? So how late is late? Can we still accept students like uh, who come in one third through the semester or two thirds through the semester? So what are the things we have to do uh, you know, to, to what they call this to, uh, to keep our academic integrity, you know, so things like, things like this. So this is why I put this in my recommendation. We need clear guidelines on late enrollees. Okay. You know. uh, thank you. Uh, we also have a couple of questions from YouTube. Um, one is from Zinia Lazaro. She's asking, what are your best practices to prevent plagiarism? Since most students are online and they are, and they are swamped with a lot of activities and deadlines, thus the temptation to do it is stronger than ever. Uh, Professor Lee. Um, this was a concern before, uh, but if you use Google Classroom, there is actually a plagiarism checker. Uh, that you can automate and it will scan your student submissions. And if it detects any kind of plagiarism, um, it catches most, obviously no system is 100% is perfect, um, but it does catch most forms of common student plagiarism, especially if it was taken from online sources. And so um, the system will alert the student and it won't allow them to submit until they solved that particular uh, section. So yeah. Um, and then I also run it by myself, just as a quick scan. Um, the usual, you check the citations, you check bibliography, you make sure that everything, what is cited is actually uh, cited well and is cited correctly. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, okay, uh, maybe last two short questions, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we have one from Leslie Joy Diaz. In lowering the number of students per course, do you have to offer more sections for those that are prerequisite of another course scheduled to be offered the following semester? How did you balance this with the need to also lower the teaching load of faculty members? Okay, I think that's my question. Uh, what we did was actually to distribute the teaching load uh, from uh, first semester, second sem, and mid-year. Uh, very few of us actually teach mid-year. Uh, that's the time we do our research and so on. But since uh, we have lowered the teaching load to nine units per teacher, uh, we have to complete no, the 24 unit requirement for a full load for the whole year. So we kind of distributed it throughout the school year. Uh, we did not, uh, we did, uh, we did not offer more sections uh, in the sense that we doubled no? the number of sections, no. Uh, but we tried to figure out how many students will be served. So as I mentioned in my talk, there, uh, there are actually around 2,000 to 2,500 students who enroll in our department per year. Uh, freshmen, around 2,000. So we served 900, so there's 1,000 more who are not served. Uh, the next 900 will be served next semester, and the rest will be uh, served uh, during the mid-year. So we kind of distributed the load. No? We did not add any uh, significant number to what we are actually doing or offering per semester. Thank you, Dr. Tope. Um, and we, uh, the last, just for the last question, uh, see, um, uh, from YouTube, from... Um, Ginger, Ginger Abigail Kwan, in light of the recent announcement of the possibility of blended learning, is the department considering limited face-to-face -face classes for certain courses next semester? I'm sorry. 
Kay Dr. Tope yata. Ayan. Ay, sorry, sorry. Can you can you say that again? Um, well, are we considering the blended learning? Uh, for, uh, we have no guidelines no. as yet. Yeah. And the university has not said anything about second sem. I know Ateneo has. Hmm. I doubt that we will because, well, you know, naman how galing the pandemic response is in this country, no? Hmm. Um, so, <laughs> I really hmm. doubt. Um, yeah. Blended learning in the future is certainly is certainly the future. Yeah. So, beyond pandemic, a lot of this will have to incorporate with, you know, face-to-face and, and all that. But as for second semester, we can't say because we haven't received official word. Yes, so we're still operating on the no face-to-face classes for second sem. So uh, blended learning, uh, we will keep that suspended until times are better. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ike and Dr. Tope. And uh, that's all the time we have. We'd like to thank everyone again for attending and for sending in their questions. Uh, some the. the Questions that we were not able to answer live are being answered or will be answered privately. Um, and uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you again. And uh, we hope that this webinar has been helpful okay. in taking on the challenges of your respective classes or even just in providing comfort in uh, navigating these extraordinary times. Thank you. Thank you.